Welcome to Fireside Giants, a featured podcast by Empire Sports Media. I'm your host, Alexander Wilson, my co-hosts, Anthony Arvardo and Mike Irapino. Give us a follow on Twitter if you haven't. Alex Wilson ESM, Anthony underscore Rivardo, Mike underscore NYY. And if you're listening and watching on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button. We're doing cool live streams and so many different things to kind of keep us occupied while we continue to wait for sports to return. It feels like we're so close, but we're just not there yet. And I, I for one, am going absolutely nuts. The world is in shambles, justifiably. And, you know, we're... Uh, going through some pretty tough times and sports usually acts as our way out of a lot of these situations um but that this is a time for us all to reflect and kind of look at what's important in the world um and and sports seemingly is a big a big factor in most of our lives um in our culture and society but just to start off how are you guys doing anthony and mike tired um that's about it not really doing much so (laughs) Yeah, I'm pretty much the same, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I feel you guys. And for everybody listening, I hope you guys are safe, healthy, doing well. It seems like the virus suddenly isn't that big of a deal anymore, (laughs) but it's still very prevalent. We hope there isn't a second wave, and, you know, all we can do is is stay safe and and protect ourselves and just be ready for everything. Um, And, you know, the Giants and the NFL are certainly doing so. They're still on pace to carry out the schedule on a normal a normal level essentially so they're ready to go and september is still the effective start date for the season regular season and preseason are both in place and for now everything seems to be virtual news is is sparse and scarce there isn't much to talk about in terms of you know what is actually going on behind the scenes it's it's pretty much a wasteland out there if you guys are actually keeping up with the giants and everything that's going on they're isn't much to talk about in terms of relevant news that's current but you know we want to provide you with as much information as possible and just cool stuff to talk about i've seen a lot of websites doing like you know this day in giants history um, which is kind of cool um you know flashing back to some old memories and for our, our seasoned fans i'm sure you have a lot more than we do and you know i would love to hear in the comment section you know what is your favorite memory from the giants past and like what what was the time period like what was going on and, and what was so important um, about those games about that time in your life because for me you know flashing back to my childhood it really was those two Super Bowls and I'm sure you guys can agree those two Super Bowls were the most impactful and significant moments in our young Giants uh, careers um, you know we're all part of the team on some on some existential level so I'm pretty excited to, to continue moving forward with the club in general but you know just to talk about what what we're going to expect from the 2020 campaign do you guys think i'm going to start with anthony do you guys think that the youth is ready to take a step forward and they're going to show significant improvement or you know just minor improvements uh i think it will be significant improvement as long as the coaching staff gets them ready i know it's going to be difficult because a lot of stuff is virtual and it's going to be a while before they can all get in one place and actually work on things but As long as they're able to do that and do it well, I think it will be significant improvements, especially from the likes of Daniel Jones. Um, I think Dexter Lawrence is going to take a huge jump this year. Uh, Let's see about DeAndre Baker. You know, I I thought he was going to take a big jump, but now we're still waiting on uh, having some questions answered regarding his legal status. So, um, but definitely Julian Love as well. We talked to him. He seems ready and seems really determined to get better. So. Uh, I definitely do think the youth is going to improve a lot, and I think there's going to be a lot of really young players who become the focal point of the team. I agree with that. I mean, I think it's going to be more of a gradual growth. I don't expect this team to come out and just set the league on fire in week one. I think it'll be gradually as the weeks go on, this team will get better and better, and that's pretty much what you expect from young players. But, you know, I don't expect this team to start out 5-0 and is what I'm saying. I just think it'll be one of those seasons, once again, where there's probably a slow start, kind of like 2018, and then they start winning games the second half of the year. So does that mean they'll make the playoffs? Probably not. But the main thing is, and the important thing is, that the uh, younger guys on this team will get better which at the end of the day is the most important part absolutely and i actually have a question for you guys in terms of just the overall like physicality of the nfl nowadays and you know for the older fans that remember the old good old football where you could hit someone in the head and you were rewarded with a with a new contract how do you think the physicality has changed in the nfl do you think that players are more physical now than they were years ago i think that they are just physically well essentially that's really it they're more 
you know, have more resources available to them, more training, and just better technology. I think they're just overall stronger players. Um, but relevant to other players now, it seems normal. But back in the day, you know, these guys weren't as big. The offensive linemen were not as big as they are now. These people are like, th- like three hundred and sixty pounds, <laughs> like six seven. Uh, though you come across one of those, if I was an alien coming from another another planet and I just dropped onto Earth, I'd be like, what the hell are these people eating? Like, what is, <laughs> like seriously, like these these humans, even for regular people, you walk by them in the street. And you're like that person doesn't belong on this earth, you know. Like that's a that's an alien of sorts, and you know, seeing them slim down is the craziest part. I think it was Sean O'Hara, maybe, or was it Christine? One of those one of those older, uh, you know, offensive linemen left the NFL and dropped like 160 pounds. <laughs> Do you have any idea how many calories you have to eat every day to maintain that size? And your body's just like a big ass marshmallow, essentially, like the Michelin Man walking around. But that leads me to, to say, like, do you think that um, the NFL nowadays is just more physical and just bigger overall than it was back then? And what we're seeing now, that's kind of why all these injuries are popping up. Do you think it's it's kind of playing a part in all those injuries as well? I'd say the players are definitely bigger and stronger and more athletic and all of that. But I don't think the play style is more physical because when you turn on, like, 2010 uh, highlights – I know that there was this one video that I used to watch because they called that season, I don't know if it was 10 or 12, whenever, but they called it like the concussion season where everybody was just head bashing each other and there was like 100 concussions that season and then they finally implemented new rules to tone it down and they've they've implemented a lot of rules recently. And like even when you think back, like if you go and you watch uh, highlights from 20, 30 years ago, quarterbacks had like no protection they were just the same as any receiver you could just smash them at all you want and it's not like that anymore but i think that's because of how much bigger and stronger all of these players have mm-hmm. gotten so they've, they've recognized that they have to start protecting these players because of how you know human beings are really just essentially evolving and becoming more dangerous machines on a football field so i i think definitely the play style is less physical but the players are more physical yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I think it's it's pretty evident that players now, as compared to even before I was born, are just a lot bigger than they were. I think Pat Sherman was a defensive tackle, if I remember correctly. Like that guy does not look like a defensive tackle. So, um, but as you said though, it was much more physical even 10 years ago. I remember watching Cam Chancellor and Patrick Willis and Ray Lewis hit these guys and you know basically almost take their heads off. And if you saw that now, they might end up like Vontez Perfect and basically get kicked yeah. out of the league. So it, it's kind of crazy how things have evolved in just a short amount of time basically less than a decade but at the same time it is for player safety and i do think it's it's the right move um you know looking um you know for the future absolutely so let me ask you a question i want anthony i want to start with you i want you to reenact what it would be like for you to come across like brandon jacobs in the gap or like vontez perfect you see him coming out of the corner of your eye and you're about to catch a pass like what are you doing in that situation are you are you crumbling to the ground like a small infant child or are you taking that hit for your team because Daniel Jones just slung you the rock on third and ten, and you're about to catch that first down in the Super Bowl? Um, okay. If I'm meeting Brandon Jacobs in the hole, I'm not. I'm just gonna turn around and run the other way. Um, but if what I'm, if he can if catch I'm, you though? If I'm he's catching, fast, man. I don't think he's gonna target me. I think he's just gonna run away. I hope. <laughs> he's gonna target. He's gonna be like that's Anthony. Get him <laughs> to run straight for you. <laughs> well, I don't know what to do at that point. I guess I'll just hit the deck. Um, if it's if I'm going over for Go a for pass the over the middle, third down, um, I I'll try to shield my body in a way. I'll go for the catch, but I'm not gonna die for the catch. Uh, I'll try and catch it and hit the ground immediately, and hopefully there's enough time for me to secure it and hit the ground without dying. But if I get hit, I get hit. Um, thankfully, medical technology has advanced a lot too in recent years. So. It can't bring you back to life though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying at your size and my size and probably Mike's size, we take a hit from Vontez Perfect to the head over the middle. We're dead. Like my brain is is soup for the elderly now. It's not even it's not even close. Like I can't believe Antonio Brown survived that one hit when he got nailed across the middle and he was just out cold. Like this guy bounced back up after a few minutes and he continues to play football, or rather, did continue to play after he got kicked out of the league. But you know, I'm thinking about myself getting hit in the head like that. I literally think my brain would collapse. Just dust. It'd be like it'd be like a you know end game. Maybe just 
snap his finger and my whole body would turn to freaking dust. I, I can't even imagine a hit like that. And that's like where my perspective leans when I think that these rules, these new instituted rules, because players are getting so physical and strong, it makes sense. Because you know, thinking about how how bad it would hurt if I got hit, even if I was pay, being paid millions of dollars, like you know, Sterling Shepard's one concussion away from ending his his uh, career prematurely. You know, my you know, so that that's kind of scary. But Mike, how, how what is your reaction to that? Are you are you going for the catch? You know, Super Bowl, you work so hard to get there. Are you you know, end game getting dusted? Um, yeah, if I'm being paid for it, and I feel like when I play sports, I'm pretty competitive. I'm definitely nowhere near an NFL level, but at the same time, I would still try. And I've already split my head open like three times in my life, and one of them was playing football. So what's one more at this point? I really don't care. I'd probably just go all out and, you know, would I complete the catch and probably make it? Probably not. But at the same time, I would give my best effort for the team if for some reason I was out there. I respect You're it. extremely, extremely respectful. I respect you for that. I, on the other hand, would probably just drop my pads right where I stand <laughs> before the play even starts. Like, if I'm on a football field, I'm like five foot eight, 160 pounds. Like, the small cornerbacks are bigger than me. You know, like, D- like what's his name? Um, Dante Dion was bigger than me. And this guy was in the NFL. You know what I mean? Like, Dante Dion is like the midget of the NFL. He, like, k- kind of like. Um, you know, I don't Darren know. Darren Sproles so or many, something. Like the Darren heavy. Sproles, but but Sproles is a heavy man. Like yeah. if you get hit by Darren Sproles, big legs. you're 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 gonna feel it. He's got big legs. You know, he's like a stout. He's like a Ray Rice kind of guy. He's like small. He he's like big center of gravity. You're gonna get. It's like a little bowling ball. You think of like Ray Rice and Maurice chest. Jones, Drew, guys like that. They're probably oh, like man. 50 pounds heavier than me, but they're like the same height, and that's just All a muscle. scary thought. Like their thighs are probably like three times the size of mine. It's just insane. <laughs> Even Barkley, even Saquon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you see this guy doing those deadlifts the other day? Yep. Or what it was uh the squats? I don't even know what it was. Squats. squats yeah, he's doing yeah. squats. He's squats he's like, like, he has to wear down. these like, yeah, he has to wear these like really really small shorts because his thighs literally just break through them. <laughs> like, these tiny little shorts, uh, you know, like the little yoga people wear. It, it's like you can't even. It's insane. The guy, the guy is a freak of nature, and that's what I'm saying. Like. If there's any justification that aliens exist, he is the perfect example um, for The Martian. Um, I think that's what Matt Damon was looking for in the movie was Saquon Barkley. But, you know, we didn't know it yet. Now we do. But I just, I'm just like blown away at how big some of these guys are. And Barkley, like going forward, I kind of want to talk about him just for a split second. I really want to dive into the pass rush, but Barkley is now on my mind. He is extremely exciting to watch and we haven't seen his full potential yet which is why i'm so excited for the 2020 season the giants haven't had a good offensive line and like i said before these guys are massive and when you got when you bring a guy like andrew thomason who's a little bit small for the left tackle position and we did a a, a lot of review last week if you didn't listen to the episode last week you should go check it out because it's it really dives into the offensive line matt Parrott. Uh, Nate Solder, all of these different players, and gives you a good inside look from uh, Matt, who is our offensive line analyst. Really, really cool guy, and really breaks it down well for everybody. You you see what they have now compared to the last two years, and it's exponentially different. Saquon should theoretically have a much improved season next year if he stays healthy, and you know that leads me to the question I want to ask: Is what do you think his production will look like? Do you think he's going to have his best year yet? I know his rookie season was phenomenal, but do you think 2020 will be his best year yet? I do, and I think it's more because of Jason Garrett than it is because of Saquon Barkley. I just think that he runs an offense that's really running back friendly. Um, the Cowboys have led the league in rushing like, or been in the top five in rushing like every single year with Jason Garrett. I mean, the dude knows how to scheme a run game, and I think that's just kind of it's what he does. He's just going to get that running back to rush for like 1,500 yards every year or or the running attack to do it. And so I think it's going to lead to a huge year from Saquon. And I think he probably could surpass his rookie year numbers. I know he led the league in scrimmage yards that year. I think he could definitely do that again in, in this new offense. 
I'm yeah. with you. I think it's <clears throat> it's Jason Garrett, and it's also the offensive line improvements. I mean, I, I complain more than anybody about taking a running back that early, but now they have the necessary offensive line to do this, and they have their quarterback of the future, which is great. Are the outside weapons perfect? Not really, but I think everything else is in a good position for Barkley to, as you said, put up around 1,500 yards. And I do think Jason Garrett's a type of coach when he calls plays who wants to stick with the run. I went back and watched the Giants game against the Cowboys when he was calling plays, and the Giants got up like 24 or nothing but he was still running the ball like he commits to it and the Cowboys got back in that game and I'm just very excited for Barkley I mean DeMarco Murray had you know almost 400 carries one year I don't expect it to get that you know that crazy but at the same time I expect around 330 350 mm-hmm. carries and if you give Barkley that many carries with a lot of open holes with a better offensive line we're talking about 1500 total yards and maybe even 600 to 800 receiving yards as well yeah and I'm looking at Ezekiel Elliott's stats right now and compared to Barkley, so let's say the last two years, Barkley rushed 261 times in 2018, 217 times in 2019. Obviously, you have to factor in the injury. But Ezekiel Elliott, the last two years, 304 rushes, 301 rushes. That's you know a significant boost in just overall running the ball, which attests to what you said, Anthony. Jason Garrett should be you know making a significant difference on the offense. And then you look at the receptions. And, you know, it's also actually really interesting to see. Barkley had 91 receptions in 2018. And Ezekiel Elliott had 77, and then he only had 54 last year. So I actually don't think that Saquon's going to be used in the in the receiving game as much as we think he will be, as, as much as they did in, the, in recent years. I also think that was very much due to Eli Manning to a degree, because Eli Manning does like to dump off the ball a lot. And he had a, such a bad offensive line, he didn't really have a choice. When you have an offensive line like Dallas, you can, one, run the ball a lot more, which is why we saw more running attempts for Ezekiel Elliott. You don't have to do as many dump-offs or screen plays. So I think that he'll prob- we'll probably see a, a downtick in, in overall um, receiving for Barkley, but his rushing is going to be far improved. And he doesn't fumble. The guy fumbled one time in his career so far, and, and Elliott fumbles like three times last year, six times in 2018. Like he doesn't, Barkley doesn't turn the ball over. And then you look at his hands, and he has pretty good hands for the most part. Um, he dropped a few balls last year, but you know, he was also injured and, and trying not to get hits to his ankle. So I think that it's, we're going to see a significant difference in Barkley overall. The entire scheme is going to be different with 12 personnel. It really comes down to health across the board. Tight end's got to stay healthy. Um, but that leads me kind of to the defensive side of the ball. And I want to talk about the pass rush and what we should expect from them. I just wrote an article this morning. It's like a band of misfit toys. Like, I have no idea what this what this unit is going to produce next season. Anthony, what do you see from Eximenez? And do you think they're going to retain Marcus Golden, or do you think he's going to sign a, a contract elsewhere? I think they'll probably end up with Marcus Golden. Um, I know we've talked about it before, and I say I don't really think that it's necessary to re-sign Marcus Golden, but for that contract what is it one year five million dollars yeah i'll take yeah. it you know i can't complain about that it's kind of a steal so and i think it's going to happen i think they'll get him back um i don't know how big of an impact he's going to make but i think oshin Zimenez is going to have a big impact this year i definitely think that he's a he's a 10 sack candidate i'm not certain that he's going to get there but i think he'll get close and i think there's a good chance that he reaches double digit sacks um i think uh when you look at him and lorenzo carter i think it's pretty clear and obvious who's who's going to get a more prominent role i think Zimenez clearly deserves it more than lorenzo carter after last season carter kind of just fell off a cliff and did not show any improvements um yeah o'shane Zimenez just seemed like he was getting better week to week and he already seemed like a smart player uh he was really good at batting passes down in training camp already like right as soon as he got there he had the intelligence to do that and then he just looks like he has more pass rush moves than lorenzo carter who just I don't know, Lorenzo Carter just super underwhelming to me. I had a, had a lot of uh, hope for him heading into 2019, but he didn't really meet any ex- expectations. So I think Zimenez mm-hmm. is different. I just I think he's the one who's actually going to meet those expectations. Um, but hopefully I'm not wrong again this year. You know, Hopefully Zimenez is the player we expect him to be. 
I agree. I yeah. think he will be that player. Um, you know, for Marcus Golden, I looked at it before. If he is not signed by July 22nd, so we're just like, you know, a little under a month and a half away from that, then he will be a Giant in 2020. He mm -hmm. cannot play for another team if I read that right. So yes. I looked at the Giant stats, you know, team stats. In 2018, they were 30th in the NFL in sacks, and uh, it was pretty rough. And then, you know, quarterback hits, they were 24th. Then 2019, they were 22nd in sacks. So they made a jump there, and then they were 11th in quarterback hit so they did make improvements from 2018 to 2019 but they're still not great improvements and then you go by each player so O'Shane Zimenez is a guy of course I love them I had him in a mock draft to the Giants I watched his highlights and said this guy is, is special he's different so I have very high hopes for him and then watching him last year we saw a lot of good games out of him as well a lot of good pass rushing moves so if that translates and you give him a full amount of you know starters worth of snaps I think he'll play with some very good numbers and I do think that you know eight nine even ten sacks is a very likely outcome for him and then Kyler Fackrell, I mean, you know, this guy was, he lost a lot of playing time last year because of precedence of Darius Smith and only had one sack. But you still look at his pressure percentage. It was 14% last year. That's still very good. So if you give that guy a full amount of snaps, you're getting some good numbers as well. And then you have Lorenzo Carter, who we mentioned at the disappointment last year. So he had 358 rushing uh, pass rushing attempts, only four and a half sacks. And that's the same number that Zimenez had. So, you know, he was pretty underwhelming for the most part. I do think Lorenzo Lorenzo Carter has a future in this league. I just don't expect him to have the ceiling that we thought we, you know, he had a year ago from what we know now. Right. I, I agree with that. I think it also might be a little bit too soon to write off Carter. He had a decent first year with the Giants. The second year is when they doubled his, they essentially doubled his snaps. They gave him a lot of opportunity and he didn't capitalize. He, he either underwhelmed in almost every category or was a gradual increase on double the snaps. So that's not what you want to see. Um, but at the same time, you can't write off guys every time like that. You Three years is generally the best practice, I think, for giving a player um, the opportunity to excel and, and improve. We saw some flashes against the New England Patriots. He had a strip sack that Golden returned for a touchdown. So, you know, we saw him show up occasionally. He just didn't do it consistently. That could have been a James Betcher thing. That that defense did not look like they understood what that scheme was about, how it was supposed to be managed, or exactly how what they should be doing at any given time. They were all over the place. And I think that Carter might have got lost in that translation because um, he was a rotational piece. He wasn't starting. So when you factor that in and look at all the other players that were struggling immensely and, how, and all the rookies they had on the team and the secondary was a Swiss cheese you start to, you know, kind of realize that that team and that unit as a whole was not set up for success. They were, none of those players played exceptionally well. Even Golden, who had 10 sacks, people were like, yeah, he was, he's okay, he's not that great. Obviously, he didn't even get a multi-year deal, so other teams are looking at him like, he's not worth the money. You know, if other teams are doing that, we can probably assume that he's not as good as we imagine he really is. And if you look at any of the players in the Giants last year, they were terrible. Dalvin Tomlinson was the only guy that I was like, he had an exceptional year. Leonard Williams came in and made a difference, but he wasn't like, like just unbelievably talented. He wasn't unbelievably productive or efficient. Dexter Lawrence showed a lot of potential, but those are the three guys. Those three interior guys were probably the best on the team. Everybody else was, was just absolute garbage. You know what I mean? Like Janoris Jenkins, your number one corner. They cut him. They were like, whatever. Like, we don't, we, we don't even care. They, they literally just cut him. He said some stupid stuff. And then they didn't even try to, to retain him. They didn't even try to, like, put him, you know, discipline him or anything. They just cut him. That's what, that's what that should tell us from a situation like that. When you're willing to cut your number one corner just for saying something, like, how many times have players across the league said crazy stuff and gotten away with it? He says one thing, and they cut him immediately. You know, it's like, okay, uh, clearly they didn't really care. They didn't see the value in him anymore. And that should be telling us right now that that defense was not set up for success. It didn't succeed. They were one of the worst in the NFL. They were probably one of the worst high school teams I've ever seen play on an NFL field before. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, this is, this is where I'm going with this. I think next year is going to be an whole entirely different team. It's new management. Besides Dave Gettleman re being retained, it's new across the board. And when I'm looking at Eximen is coming out of Old Dominion, this guy has more pass rush moves than most players that are first round draft picks. He has he has clubs, he has speed rushes, he can do so many different things and he's going to continue to develop on those uh, versatile attributes that he has. And I'm comparing his percentage of defensive snaps to Marcus Golden's right now. He had 45% of defensive snaps and Golden had 83% last year. So if you double that production for a rookie, he has 
essentially nine sacks. Nine sacks for a rookie is phenomenal. So, like Anthony said, he's only going to be improving from there. And if they give him the opportunity, as long as he doesn't pull a, a Lorenzo Carter and take 15 steps back, we're, we should see a pretty good player next year. And I think he can be a staple. He kind of reminds me of like an OC Manor build, the way he's built. Um, I wouldn't compare him to him because obviously two vastly different players. But I really like what he has as a pass rusher. And I think they're going to really utilize him in a lot of different cool ways. Um, but Mike, what do you think about kind of how the secondary is going to play into the the blitzing scheme because i know patrick graham loves to use safeties and linebackers to blitz as well especially safeties how do you think mckinney and Bill peppers are going to be used and even julian love in a three safety looks how do you think they'll be used to kind of make the defense unpredictable and the offense trying to figure out you know what they're going to do on any given occasion yeah, they will use safeties to blitz for sure. I'm sure, you know, more than most teams, I would think. I mean, watching Xavier McKinney, that guy was really good at blitzing when he was in college. So I do think, you know, using that to his strength would be a smart move. And Jabril Peppers can get it done as well. Whoever the slot corner is, can Darnay Holmes get sacks? Sure he can. So, I mean, it's really all about disguising your looks. And as we've said on previous podcasts, the Giants have to scheme up their sacks. They don't have an alpha pass rusher. It's been like that for a while, unfortunately. So you have to scheme up some of your sacks. And, you know, if, if Darnay Holmes has to get one here or there, and then Xavier McKinney gets some here or there, then that's fine. I mean, even Blake Martinez had like four or five sacks when he played under Patrick Graham, so it's going to come yeah. from all over. I think, you know, the Patriots last year didn't have a guy like over five sacks or something except for like Jamie Collins, and they were towards the top of the NFL in sacks as a team, so if they can do something similar to that, then that's a perfect scenario for the Giants. Yeah, I think that's yeah. exactly it. It's going to be a scheme-based uh, pass rush, a lot of blitzes. Uh, you mentioned Blake Martinez. Um, obviously, the difference in his blitz percentage and blitz success, blitz success rate from 2018 to 19 was like really, really drastically different um, under Patrick Graham versus under whoever Green Bay replaced him with. Um, so clearly, he's going to be more comfortable blitzing in Patrick Graham's defense. And I think when you look at the safeties, obviously Zimenez or um, uh, McKinney, I'm sorry, is going to be doing just about everything. He's going to be playing a lot of free safety. He's going to be blitzing. And I think with Jabril Peppers, when you look at him, I could see him playing a lot of linebacker this year, like in the box more often than not, kind of being a run defender, kind of similar to how we used to use Landon Collins in a way. Um, Collins was always in the box defending the run, especially against the Cowboys when we were, you know, the, him and Ezekiel Elliott would just like battle all game. And I think that could kind of be what you see from Jerome Peppers uh, heading forward. And then Julian Love, um, you mentioned like the players on defense last year that were actually good. I thought Julian Love in those five games that he started was like, he was great. I thought he was the best player on the defense. He was making plays all over the place. So I definitely hope that he doesn't see a reduced role. I hope that his role actually gets expanded upon and he gets a lot more playing time this year because I think he's a really special talent. So I'm, I'm really excited in those three players in particular, those three safeties that we have, because I think that they're all like, in a way, can, together, they're the X factor of the defense. I think they're the most versatile players and they can make a huge, huge difference on this team. Yeah, no, I agree, and I, I want to talk about Love for a second just because of how versatile he is. He's kind of been moved around from free safety to strong safety to corner to slot, and I really like him as a safety. You know, being able to play deep and closer to the line of scrimmage, I wonder how they will use them together because, like you said, that cohesive unit can be the X factor for the defense. Now, would you rather have Jabril Peppers or Julian Love lined up on tight ends? I think that's a really good question to ask. Jabril for me. It's more physical. McKinney. Yeah, that's a good answer. Well, because I want, because I'm thinking McKinney as a deep half safety. I'm thinking he's staying in the deeper portion as a ball hawk. He's a really good tackler. He can move up, but for the most part, I think he's going to be playing deeper because Jabril Peppers has that strong safety position kind of locked up. Do you? But at the same time, Love also told us that he played a lot of strong safety last year. Do you think that for specific plays they'll? feature two strong safeties and have you know one of them just kind of cover the tight end another one cover running backs or even blitz how do you think that'll work and who do you think you'd prefer to have covering the running back or tight end i think hmm, i don't know that's a good question i think maybe julian love is probably better in coverage obviously since he was a cornerback um right so probably him but he's really not as big and physical as jabril peppers so also him i don't know i guess I guess it really depends on who the matchup is and 
what they're running on offense, what we're running on defense. I think it's it's a lot more. Uh, there's a lot of confounding variables that would go into that. Um, like like you said, who who needs to guard this running back? Because depending on who the running back is and who the tight end is, that can make a huge difference. Who's more, who's it's like, a, you know, who's more of a threat? So I I think it just kind of depends week to week. Yeah, to me it doesn't matter. I just think they're all versatile enough when you're talking about Love, Peppers, and McKinney. They're all versatile. I think they can guard anybody. I mean, some better than others. I would like Jabril Peppers in a matchup with a big athletic tight end more than I would with Julian Love, but I'd probably like Julian Love more with a quick and elusive running back, you know what I mean? So it really depends on, on the situation and stuff like that. And I do think Julian Love's going to play outside corner. I know there's like you know arguments about that. Some people think he'll be a safety. Some people say slot. I personally don't think he has the quickness for slot. Doesn't mean I'm a against him as a player i still love him but like i just don't think he has that quickness that a guy like darnay holmes would have for instance so i do think he'll play a lot more outside especially in the event that deandre baker is not here next year i think he has a, a legit chance to start at the outside position yeah no i agree it, it, it should be exciting to see how they put together this defense graham's gonna really turn over a lot of a lot of pieces that we haven't seen before and while there are a lot of familiar faces returning to the giants their entire linebacker corps is essentially brand new you know, Blake Martinez and Ryan Connolly are both essentially new. We didn't see Ryan Connolly the entire season. We only saw him for four games. So we don't really know what we have him in yet. I think they're putting a lot of their chips on him developing into that everyday starter. And I really liked what I saw from him in those four games. He looked good in coverage. He was able to plug running lanes and get into the backfield extremely quickly. I love his instincts. Shooting gaps and getting into the backfield are some of the best I've ever seen. He is absolute phenom when it comes to bursting through holes and getting into the backfield to stop running running backs. As he develops that and kind of realizes and diagnoses plays as they're happening, he's going to get a lot better at actually taking those players down. There was a few missed tackles that he had, but he was right there, inches away from making tackles. He just didn't have the, the wherewithal and the experience yet to know where they're going to be. Um, and, and just doesn't know how to break down the film to its entirety at the NFL level. I'm so excited to see how he develops. Hopefully, this injury doesn't hold him back. A lot of players come back from ACL tears and are just fine. But at the same time, it's not something that's easy. And, you know, with everything going on right now, the, the lack of rehabilitation, um, all of the resources that would normally be available to him, he's kind of having to do this on his own for, the, for some of it, at least. Uh, so it, it's a lot different. It's it's going to be interesting to see how they utilize him. But I'm pretty excited about this defense. Um, you know, and before we wrap up, just kind of want to talk about one last thing. The, you said the Giants ranked 30th, right, overall defense, Mike? Uh, what 30? I think it was 30th or 31st in sacks for 2018. Okay. So where do you think they will rank overall? I know they ranked. I think NFL ranked them 30th overall last year. How much of an improvement? do you think that they will have in 2020 and where do you think they'll rank among the league we're talking about sacks right specifically just overall just overall mm, like a whole power rankings type thing yeah essentially a mm. power rankings offense type. and right. defense like just the team just defense oh okay oh, okay all right uh i'm gonna say somewhere between like 22 and 25 which isn't much of an improvement from last year, but at the same time, we're going to see improvements from individual players, so I'm okay with that. I just think there are it's a lot of new things. I don't even know if they're going to have a full training camp with the new defense, and this could be a very complex and tough defense to learn, so you have to take that into account as well. But as I said, as long as these younger players get better, then I'm fine with that, but I think as a team, there might be some struggles at first that impact their overall numbers throughout the season. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think in the 20s, I'd say around like 22, because um, I definitely think there's going to be improvement, but I do think that if you if you look at both sides of the ball, I'd say offense is the strong suit. I'd say defense, there's still some work that needs to be done. Obviously, I know I've raved about like a lot of the young talent on this team, but it still is young talent, so I expect there to be growing pains. Like We're going to see flashes of greatness here and there, but we're also going to see a lot of rookie mistakes or second-year mistakes, and it'll hold the, the unit back, but that obviously means in a few years from now, once they iron all that stuff out, we can be looking at like a really solid top tier defense, but I think right now at this stage they're they're a little bit below average, but they're creeping towards average. So around twenty, I think they'll land. Yeah, that, that's a good that's a good point. I think that you guys are kind of spot on. This next season will be a gradual improvement. Um, it won't be the biggest thing that we've ever seen, but I think that it's going to springboard them into a massive improvement in two thousand twenty one because they're going to have the cap space next year. You know, like we didn't sign a big time pass rusher this year. 
Um, and I think they're going to allocate some of that space toward you know, bolstering those those players. Also, the second year in any given scheme is always going to be better for the most part. We didn't see that with Shermer or Betcher at all. They both kind of re- actually regressed. But that was a majority because of the, I don't really know, the abnormality of how they went about the rebuild. You know, they really started the rebuild in a weird place. They really hit hit the button. They were trying the to win and rebuild at the same it. time, and it didn't work. Exactly, he, he admitted it didn't it. work. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And you know, after the first year, they were like, okay, we're in kind of a, a decent place. We have we have some momentum, and then they just hit the rebuild button all at once, th- shredded the entire defense apart, it replaced a lot of the offensive line pieces, traded away OBJ, and that's why we saw both systems regress so much. You know, that was why it happened. So we should expect to see some hiccups in year one in both, you know, Graham and Garrett's systems. But that year two is where you usually see the biggest jump. And as long as we don't hit that restart button for a second time and we put Gettleman's head on a spike, we should be in a better place to to improve. I think we'll probably, like you said, Mike, land in the 20 to 25 range. But then I think in year two, so 2021, we'll jump into like the like 10 to 15 range it'll be a bit that's a huge jump that's above yeah. average in the nfl you saying so, year two reminds me of uh matt ryan in the second year of kyle shanahan system when he went from like you know just being like a pretty good quarterback to like literally winning mvp and i know it's like yeah, kyle shanahan he's a genius it, it does happen so it, it makes me excited for that yeah me too i mean then we're gonna have to deal with the saquon barkley contracts and uh we have a long road ahead of us my friends and I, it's gonna be really crazy to see how this all unfolds like look what jamal adams is doing right now Mm. He's holding out, and he's not even in his fourth year yet. He's he hasn't even played a game or had a practice in a, as a fourth year player, What's he and he's already demanding from? an extension. He's holding out because he wants a new contract. Because no, he's I, like, I'm I, the best. Player. I know why, but what is he holding out from? Like, what are they doing right now that there even is to hold out from? Like Zoom well, meetings, he, um, virtual meetings, yeah. Which is like, mm. I, I thought they were voluntary like, you know, anyway. Most of them. They might be, but when you have the best player on your team not going to the voluntary workouts I mean, yeah, and yeah. Our, your leader, it's it says a lot. You know, it says a lot. Just don't trade him so, to the Cowboys. That's that's all I have to say. Please. Oh my God! If they trade him <laughs> to the Cowboys, I I don't even know. I'll burn Jerry Jones's hundred million dollar yacht to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that anyone has a hundred million dollar yacht is mm. just is that factual? absurd. He has a hundred million dollar. Yes. While he was on the NFL, uh, while they were drafting, like the live draft, the, well, the virtual draft, but when it was happening, he was sitting on his $100 million yacht, enjoying the view of us plebeians, you know, looking up at him <laughs> in Jerry World. All that oil money must be treating him well. It, it's really, uh, it's tough to watch, you know. My, my couch is not the same as a $100 million couch <laughs> floating on the water. I could always throw like a one of those floaty beds on the water and just sit on it yeah. to pretend it's my $100 million couch. <laughs> <laughs> oh well that's it for today boys i am uh i'm spent and the giants aren't giving us much to work with but we're, we're doing our best for everybody that's still listening and, and following along on the fireside giants we are doing everything we can and we're, we're putting out as much content as we can with no content available and no information available that we already haven't talked about so we're, we're getting creative and we're doing fun things we're, we're doing live streams on fortnite we're having some fun and, and being creative. So we hope you guys are enjoying all the content we're putting out and doing some cool uh, offensive line breakdowns. And, and Mike just did one on Don, uh, Darnay Holmes, which is awesome. So go check that out if you haven't already on YouTube. Thank you again for tuning in. Stay safe out there. And thank you for listening to Empire Sports Media with Alex, Anthony, and Mike.